We are now going to use our, our information on the crystal symmetry groups, the Brave lattices, to simplify how the tensors look in, in an example, but you could use it for whatever tensor rank you're looking at, whether it's 4 or 2 or whatever. We're going to use, of course, a tensor rank 2 because it's easier uh, to look at. But um, uh, basically, uh, the crystal symmetries allow us to only have to look at certain elements in the tensor. The way to see that is to uh, use an example. Of applying electric field, and this is going to be our example. Let's try it and true for many cases here, and. Um, and when we uh, apply electric field across this block, it goes here. Now clearly, if I look coming out of this page, if I put a two-fold axis here, uh, nothing can change. That is, just because I flipped the crystal 180 degrees, uh, there should be no change in the property of J. Or uh, uh, if, if I apply E across that same direction, it can't change in, in a normal uh, crystal. It doesn't have some sort of very bizarre property. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm kind of saying it doesn't because if I flip it around and it's the same by definition, it, it won't be different, right? So I'm going to do this 180 do flip. You'll recognize this, of course, as a monoclinic crystal because if that's the only rotation I do, remember a two-fold axis alone gives us monoclinic, right? So this is the case of a monoclinic. I'm not really using it for that, but I'll show you in a minute how we can uh, determine the uh, conductivity tensor uh, from this for a monoclinic type lattice. So let's look at the crystal systems. So by convention, let's put that two-fold axis along x3. What that means is when I rotate around z, it's going to send x2 exactly in this opposite direction. So x2 prime will be in a negative x2 direction. And um, if I do 180 degree this way, this goes 180 degrees that way. And so that's going to give us um, x1, oops, sorry, x1 prime. And then, of course, x3 is in the same direction. I'm not uh, changing anything there. So I've inserted symmetry. And let's now use the tools that we have. So we're going to transform uh, between these axes. So let's look and see uh, what that transformation is. So clearly we're going to need to have the CIJ, but you know the CIJ itself, I could do it in a very long-handed way, um, or I could do it by inspection. And the first thing we realize is, well, let's do inspection. If I say x1 prime, equals minus x1 and then I say x2 prime equals minus x2 then x3 equals x3 well of course what I'm really saying is that the cosine because remember cij is just the uh, directional cosines the angle between them the angle between uh, x1 and x1 prime is 180 degrees. Cosine of pi is a minus 1. And same thing for x2. And then x3, uh, x3 dotted with x3 is, the angle between them is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So uh, whether you write it out this way, this is a 2 by the way, or whether you do it by inspection, you can see that the transformational matrix would be uh, minus 1, 
minus 1, 1. And of course, everything else is a 0. Those of you that um, probably haven't looked at matrices in a while, uh, way to see that is the way we would use that. So let's remember what we do is we want x1, x2, x3 prime. That's going to equal this transformation matrix, right, times, so remember how this works, you take these three here and you multiply it times that. So x1 prime equals minus x1 plus 0 times x2 plus 0 times x3. Right, so let's just take this first. Right, you take this first here and you lay it along here and dot it with that, right? And that's how you get x1 prime and so on. You can see that when I do that to the next level, I get a minus x2. And then lastly, I get x3. And of course, that's what we have here. So that's the, the transformation uh, matrix. Let's use that now. I'll just uh, put it up here. And then let's use that on our conductivity. So if we use our newfound relation, or we can say sigma ij prime right, equals c i l c j m sigma l m right and so they have to be summed now when you look at this thing you can see right away that actually the only components we have are when the indices are the same so you can really uh, simplify this a lot so for example if i look at sigma one one prime i becomes one let's just do this so you can see it one l c one m sigma l m right but the only the only thing that's going to ever matter is since these already have ones i don't have to worry about this element because it's two two and i can't worry about this three three these guys are all zero so anytime a one plus something else that's not one it's zero so in fact the only one that i have to worry about is this so when uh, that one term will exist it's going to be uh, this one and under that case l and m are one and so that is going to be the new sigma one one prime one one times one one is actually the same so it uh, it doesn't change sigma one one doesn't under change it doesn't change under <clears throat> the transformation where I had put the twofold axis uh, um, over the uh, over the um, uh, the z th the z direction right and that makes sense right because it's kind of what we were doing and the same thing would be for two two you get the same uh, the same result but um, let me look at uh, a few other terms let's look at sigma one two. So suppose I had a conductivity tensor in the, um, and you know, in this, um, I want to look at the off diagonal component because remember this is the CIJ, not the, right, the, not the conductivity tensor. So sigma one two, which is going to give us what you realize with this one is that again, the only time they're not zero is when this is one and this is two. So that case is going to be C 
one one c two two and because this is a one and that's a two that's going to be this one <clears throat> they're both negative and indeed that doesn't change right now we get into a predicament when we reach sigma one three it's got a very similar case but you can tell it's going to happen because the sign changes so again same thing it's only going to matter when the indices are the same uh, which which is uh, sorry screw this up this is a three and so it's going to be a three three so there's a one here and a three here because this is a one and that's a three and then these only are non-zero if this is a one and this is a three they have to be the same which makes this one three but now this one's a, a minus a, a one and this was a minus one so you actually have a problem now you say well why is that a problem well remember that uh, these tensors must remain invariant uh, so you'd have to have um, somehow a minus Sigma 1 3 equal a Sigma 1 3 and that is only possible if it's zero so when you see this situation in a transformation like this uh, then what it means is the answer is zero this has to be zero because zero can be both uh, plus and minus right I mean, it's a way to avoid if I put in anything else then the the tensor won't be uh, in invariant so what that means is that there's only five independent elements that you need to worry about now in the connectivity tensor for a twofold case uh, so the which is the monoclinic case remember how I got here I uh, put in a twofold axis and said well when I rotate right uh, that's a transformation so I found out what that transformation thing was and I applied it to uh, Sigma IJ when I apply it to sigma ij, uh, certain things happen, and it creates this situation where I have, you could do it for the other ones too. You could see that they have to be zero. And so you can see that um, this is what the connect, you cannot have a more full conductivity tensor with the axes the way we've defined them. Uh, now, of course, I can pick a different set of axes in the universe and mess this all up, but it's not going to be with the Cartesian system, and it's not going to be with a convention of having one of the twofold axes line up along one of those Cartesian axes, right? So if I have a convention, which we do, where, you know, I have a monoclinic lattice and I line up the z-axis with the twofold axis, then this is the uh, thing. Now, one of the interesting things is that, um, so unlike the triclinic case, I don't have to worry about elements over here. Now, you ask, are these the same? They're not necessarily the same. In this case, in conductivity, they typically are. Okay, but there's nothing in this derivation that says that they have to be. It turns out that most second rank tensors, uh, those will be equal, but not all properties are that way. So, um, so you go, the twofold axis present, the twofold axis present in the monoclinic ends up restricting what the tensor actually looks like. There's only one, two, three, four, five elements that are needed to find a connectivity tensor once you put the twofold axis in there. We can do similar questions, like um, uh, we're going to do this later, uh, but one more example 
would be uh, what about inversion? So let's look at the case where we have inversion. And remember, inversion, uh, uh, we have x1 prime equals minus x1. So every axis is inverted. Right, so if you were to look at, you know, just the Cartesian thing, uh, all it is is that this becomes that, this becomes that, this becomes that, right? So everything gets flipped. So we end up with a Cij that actually has all minus ones, right? Remember, we had minus ones before with the twofold axis, but uh, with now the z-axis also being uh, inverted, if you will, then you get a minus 1 here instead of 1. So now let's just uh, uh, see what happens under, under that case. Um, what you can tell by inspection, for all the ones that survive that are non-zero, we no longer have a minus 1 and a 1, which means that that this is um, always positive, which means that you can't drop out anything. And so uh, basically whatever you have in the original uh, sigma uh, appears here. So unlike the other case where we ended up with a minus sigma 1, 3, and to make it invariant, we had to put zeros there. Uh, in this condition, uh, you can never achieve that because each one of these is always minus 1. There is no way to achieve anything but a minus 1 in each one of these. And you always have two of them. Right? If we take the monoclinic case again, then... Uh, we look at the possibilities under that case. There's a two-fold, the two over m uh, possibilities, right? And uh, or m. Now the two over m is a two-fold axis plus an inversion, and uh, the inversion doesn't do anything. So this case is immediately reduced to two-fold. And so a 2 over m would give you uh, the same uh, situation as the twofold uh, axis. So um, we talked about that briefly before. It might have been obscure, but here you can see it another way, where because the inversion center does not do anything in a 2 over m, the inversion piece just goes out. The twofold case, and we end up with the same situation where we would have a sigma 1, 1, a sigma 2, 2, a sigma 3, 3, a sigma 1, 2, and a sigma 2, 1. And then everything else would be zeros. So it doesn't matter whether it's 2 over m uh, or 2. You would end up with the same, uh, the same situation.